Oh. Good morning. How are you? You doing well, I hope. As he said, I don't have to preach slow. I'm just kidding. I won't be long. I got a phone call this morning from Pastor Derek at about 6:30. He is under the weather, no pun intended. Um and he told me, "Hey, you got to preach this morning." So I said, okay, I'm going to tell you a funny story. So this weekend, we're having the baby dedication. I have like a meeting this afternoon. Yesterday, the youth went to Ship Island uh, out there in Gulfport. And I, I'm like, you know what? I'm just going to take it easy. I'm going to be a dad this weekend. So I, wasn't, I come every Sunday prepared to preach because you never know when something's going to happen. Well, this is like the one Sunday I don't prepare anything. And I am so sunburnt right now. That it hurts to think about talking to you. But the Lord is here. I I have one favor to ask of you today. When you leave church today, I hope you didn't have plans for a picnic. But um, the youth are doing a fundraiser today at WOW. Up there on Judge Press. If you would go eat lunch at WOW today and mention the movement anytime between 12 and is it 5 or 6? 6. Between 12 and 6. You can go get lunch and dinner if you want. But just mention the movement. It helps with the youth ministry. It helps us with the youth conference coming up. So I would really appreciate if you would do that. Thank you very much. If you would, pray with me real quick. Heavenly Father, I thank you for this morning. I thank you for your word. I thank you for your presence. I thank you that you're here. I thank you, Father God, that nobody came this morning to hear me. I didn't even come to hear me this morning. We came to hear you. We came here for you and only for you. I thank you, Father, what you're going to say through me this morning. Father God, I love you and I honor you and I praise you. In Jesus' name, everybody said... Amen. Look at your neighbor and ask them, what do, you, what do they see? Person next to you say, what do they see? It's an interesting question to ask. What do they see? If you would open your Bibles to Acts chapter 4. If someone want to grab me a water bottle, that would be amazing. Acts chapter 4. Thank you, sir. Verse 13. Acts chapter 4, verse 13 says, Now when they saw the boldness of Peter and John and perceived that they were uneducated and untrained men, they marveled and they realized that they had been with Jesus. And seeing the man who had been healed standing next to them, they could say nothing against it. People love to be right. I hope you didn't know that. People love to be right. People, in more than loving to be right, they love to prove themselves right. This week uh, on Facebook, whether it's a good thing or not, I was in three different abortion debates this week because um, I do believe that we're supposed to have an answer. We're supposed to stand for truth. So I did. One, one gentleman did not like truth, so he called me every name in the book, and it's okay. Jesus loves you. But we just don't like to lose, I guess. I don't know. But... Um, we love to do this back and forth. I love to debate sports. Like, if I could, I would be one of those people on TV who sit there and just yell about sports opinions all day. Like, if you show me somebody who thinks LeBron James is the best of all time, we will talk for four hours, and I will make fun of them because they're wrong. And I'm going to do this over and over and over again. Right? It's, I, I really, like, I enjoy it, and I love to be right, and if I know that I'm going to see somebody who's a LeBron James fan, I will go make sure I got updated information so I can prove to them that I am right and they are wrong. It's, it, uh, it's, it's a problem, but we all do it. You may not care about sports, but I promise you, if I asked you how to cook gumbo and there were two different people giving me recipes, no, you don't do that. Yes, you do. No, you don't. It would turn to this brawl over how to cook gumbo because everyone loves to be right, and we also enjoy to prove that we're right. But something else happens, which is sadly the case is that the world loves to try and prove Jesus wrong. The world loves to try and discredit the gospel. They love to try and discredit the word of God. They love to try and discredit who we stand for and what we stand for. This is why Jesus said, if they persecute you, remember they first persecuted me. I shouldn't be being persecuted for Chris. I should be being persecuted because of the Christ they see in me. People love to try and prove Jesus wrong, but this is the thing, they can't. Like, it's impossible. 
And if anybody is here this morning from an atheist perspective or another worldview, I'm going to let you know, like, people have been trying to do this for thousands of years, and ain't nobody done it yet. Like, nobody has been able to disprove or prove God wrong or prove him wrong. But while they can't prove Jesus wrong, guess what they can do? They can prove you wrong. Pastor Chris, what do you mean? They'll never prove God wrong, but they can prove you wrong. You know how they can prove you wrong? When our actions don't line up with what we say. When we put on a performance of Christianity but don't have a lifestyle following behind it, they will prove us wrong. I can remember being at a Sweet 16 party when I was in high school. And we're on the floor dancing, and you're dancing, right? Sometimes it doesn't look the most Christian. Right? And we used to do whatever we're doing. And there was this guy, still one of the best guitar players I've ever known. I had been ministering to him. We had been talking back and forth for a while. And I'm dancing on the floor, whatever. And we had had real conversation. He had kind of turned and softened his position some. This was like a long, ongoing thing. And I'm on the dance floor at the Sweet 16 party, and this guy walked up to me and says, hey, I didn't really know Christians dance like that. What do you say? See, he didn't prove Jesus wrong. He proved me wrong. Because at the end of the day, guys, it really doesn't matter what we say if we're not living it. And here, I want you to go to Acts chapter 4 again. I'm going to give you a bunch of recap on what happened because I don't have all, I don't want to take a whole bunch of time. So we're in Acts chapter 4, and that's the statement that the Pharisees are making. I'm going to tell you, I'm going to catch you up on the story. So in Acts chapter 3, Peter and John, they go walking into the temple. They're just going to do their thing. And there's a guy sitting at the temple gate, and he's lame, and he's begging for money. His friends had put him there. Don't you find it amazing that even the world expects the church to do things the world won't do? I said that again in case you missed it. People who aren't even believers expect Christians to do things that they themselves won't necessarily want to do. Well, that shouldn't be homeless people because if the church drove her to church, they'd be taking care of all the homeless people. I've heard that before. We're going to hear this over and over again the rest of our lives because that's the way it is. They look and try to find any way they can to get at us. So Peter and John walk by. There's a man sitting at the temple gate begging, and Peter looks at him, and he looks him straight in the eyes, and he says, look at me. The man looks at him, and he says, silver and gold I do not have, but what I have I give to you in the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth. Get up and walk. And the guy jumps up, check this out, and runs into the temple. Now let's stop for a second and think about how many people had just walked into church. And the lame man was sitting there, and ain't nobody prayed for him. Nobody gave him anything. But they walked in the door and was going about their business. The, the guy gets healed and runs into church. That's telling me that the guy wanted to make sure all the Christians knew, or the people in the building knew, that somebody had Jesus on the outside. So he runs into the, into the temple, and everybody's like, oh my gosh, he's walking. And they're all excited, and they're all freaking out. And so Peter starts preaching, because Peter has a habit of praying for somebody. They get healed, some crazy happens, and he starts preaching. People get saved. So Peter starts preaching. It says 5,000 people were saved that day. And so what ends up happening there is there's such a commotion in the town that the Pharisees find out about it, and they have him arrested. I hope that one day I get to say that I was arrested for healing a man. Please, I don't want to get arrested for unpaid parking tickets. I'm going to get arrested for healing somebody because it causes so much commotion. And so they put him in jail and they start questioning him. And we're going to go to Acts chapter 4, verse 5. Now, Peter gets arrested and caught, and he is standing. Now, I'll give you a little timeline here. This is about maybe three months after Jesus was crucified. Maybe. It's probably less than that. Peter gets arrested and caught, and he's brought before the same people that just had Jesus crucified. The same high priest, the same temple court, the same people accusing him were accusing Jesus a few weeks before. And he stands up, and it says, and it came to pass 
On the next day that the rulers and the elders and the scribes, as well as Annas, the high priest, and Caiaphas, and John, and Alexander, and as many as were of the family of the high priest were gathered together in Jerusalem. And when they had set them in their midst, they asked, By what power or by what name have you done this? Then Peter, filled with the Holy Spirit, said to them, Rulers and people of Israel, If we this day are judged for a good deed done to a helpless man, by what means has he been made well? Let it be known to you all and to all the people of Israel that by the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, whom you crucified and whom God raised from the dead, by him this man stands here before you. This is the stone which was rejected by you builders and has become the chief cornerstone, nor is there salvation in any other, for there is no other name under heaven given among men by which we must be saved. Peter stands up in front of the Pharisees, in front of all these people who were extremely educated, and he puts them all in their place. He shuts them up. This is an uneducated fisherman. He's an ignorant fisherman. All he knows is life skills. All he knows is how to catch fish. He's standing in a room with the most educated religious people in his nation. He is standing right before them. He is looking them right in the eyes, and they are all speechless. Because there's an uneducated man standing in front of him. One of my favorite things about being a Christian is watching God take the foolish things and use them to confound the wise. Because the world puts all of its basis, all of its hope in knowledge. I put mine in Jesus. Jesus trumps knowledge every time. And you might be saying, well, how is that possible? Try it. Step out and do something, and you'll see him do something that don't make any sense. I remember hearing a story of a missionary who had a go. It was a military, he was in a, a chaplain of the military in the army, and he was going on a journey, had to go preach or go do some ministry. Some tragedy had happened, and he had to take this Jeep. So he takes the Jeep, and he goes riding, and they got the extra gas tanks in the back, and he, he asked one of the, the guys in the, the, the pit, he said, Hey, uh, this gas in there and he said yeah you're good to go all right so he goes on the drive goes does what he got to do and he's coming back and he runs out of gas so he starts filling it up again he fills it up and makes it back home when he gets back home the guy from the the, the mechanical pit runs out and says how'd you make it back we've been trying to radio you and call you that wasn't gas they put the wrong cans they put water in your tank and your spare gas cans was nothing but water. How did you get back? Did you, did you not run out of gas? I said, no, I ran out of gas twice. I had to put both tanks back in the, the engine to get here. And he said, but that was water. How did you get there? I don't know. Ask God. And the man walked off. You can't explain things like that. You can believe it or not. But that's the situation. God always confounds the wise. Always, 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 always. Now, why was Peter able to stand before these extremely educated and religious people and put them in their place. It's very simple. The priests were working with head knowledge, but Peter was working with revelation knowledge. Peter was working with head knowledge. I mean, the Pharisees were working with head knowledge, but Peter had revelation knowledge. The Pharisees had tradition. Peter had an encounter. Now, got, make sure you understand something. Religion is empty without Jesus. It's formalities, it's tradition, and there's no power in it at all. When you add Jesus to the situation, what has been being done for thousands of years all of a sudden has power, all of a sudden has purpose, all of a sudden brings life because he's in it. These Pharisees had nothing but head knowledge. They had never encountered Jesus, but Jesus himself had walked through a wall in front of the disciples. They had seen him in his resurrected body. They had placed their fingers in his nail prints. They had had an encounter with Jesus, and an encounter always trumps an opinion. Let's say that again. An encounter always trumps an opinion. You can give me stacks of evidence that Jesus isn't real, and I can say, okay, if he's not real, who healed my hyperextended elbow when I was 14 years old while I was playing drums? 
when I could not move my elbow at all, I was throwing it at a symbol like this, trying to keep it on beat. And I was crying the entire time. Who healed it? Because in between the first and second song, something touched my elbow and I was totally healed. Who did that? I understand your scientific theories and all. I understand all that, but you can't explain that. I could give you story after story. We could pass the mic around and hear story after story after story of people who don't care about opinions because they've had an encounter. They've had an encounter. And you may be here today and you may be saying, Pastor Chris, well, I've never had an encounter. Awesome. You can get one. The Bible says he is waiting to show himself to those who diligently seek him. He is waiting to do it. Now let's go to Acts chapter 4, verse 13 again. Now when they saw the boldness of Peter and John, and remember, I just gave you all the backstory. Peter stands up and he tells them all the stuff. Notice it doesn't say when he heard what they said. It doesn't say when he saw how they were dressed. It doesn't say, obviously it wouldn't, but it, it doesn't say what was on their Facebook profile, what was on the bumper sticker of their car, what was on their T-shirt. What does it say? When they saw the boldness of Peter and John and perceiving that they were uneducated men the only conclusion they could come to was what they had been with Jesus. The title of this message was, What Do They See? Because when someone looks at you, what do they see? We're billboards. We are advertisement for Jesus. So when someone looks at you, when someone looks at me, what is it that I am advertising? What is it that I am displaying? Because I guarantee you, every single one of us have gone to the grocery and we've gone to buy something or you've gone to the store and you bought that shirt from the sale rack and you get to the front and it's not on sale and you're like, false advertisement. This shirt was on the 50% off rack. Yeah, but it doesn't belong there. I don't care if it doesn't belong there. That's where it was and that's what I'm going to pay. Because that is what it was advertised as. If we get that upset about a shirt, how upset should we be when someone looks at us as Christians and it's false advertisement? If we get that riled up over going to the restaurant thinking it's kids eat free on Friday and it was Thursday, but the sign said Friday, and we get all bent out of shape. Well, your sign said this. It's supposed to be this. You gave me this impression. You told me it was going to be this way. But when I got here, it didn't match what you told me. How often does this happen? Because again, it didn't say that when they heard Peter talk, not when they heard Peter sing, not when they heard Peter preach, but when they saw the boldness of Peter, they knew that they had been with God. We have to understand that they were only bold because of the Holy Spirit. And let's stop for a second and, and, and think about this. Some of these Pharisees are the people Peter denied Jesus to. Like some of these people knew that Peter, not even three months before, had denied Jesus. Now he's preaching to them. Want to know something really awesome? Who you were is irrelevant to the Holy Spirit. It's irrelevant. It does not matter who you were when the Holy Spirit is involved because if any man is in Christ, he's a new creation. The old has passed away and all things become new. It's the Holy Spirit that comes in, comes on the inside of you, changes you by changing the way that you think. We conform no longer to the pattern of this world. We're transformed by the renewing of our mind. That's the Holy Spirit that comes in and makes these changes in us, makes these differences in us. It's not you. Aren't you so thankful that you don't have to become a better person? You have to let the Holy Spirit make you a better person. I am incapable of making myself better. I am incapable of it. 
I am as flawed as any human being walking the planet. No, I've never murdered someone, but I have most certainly have, hate, have had hate in my heart. I have never committed adultery in my life, but I have looked at someone wrong. I, Proverbs says, the Lord hates those that stir dissension. Now, I may have never started a rebellion and, and, and you know, was this big political leader, but I guarantee you I've slandered before. I've gossiped before. I'm as low down and as nothing as anybody else, but it's not me, for I have been crucified with Christ, and it's longer I that live, but Christ that lives within me. This life I live in the body, I live by faith in the Son of God. It isn't me. Thank God it isn't me. I can remember when I first became youth pastor. It's funny. Destiny's baby got dedicated this morning. When I was first youth pastor, nobody in the youth group liked me. And if you ask them, they will say, yeah, we didn't like him. Nobody did. And I knew this. But yet I was called to pastor him. And I remember thinking to myself, how in the world... Am I going to pass to people who don't like me? And the Holy Spirit told me, you don't have to. I will. Just do what I tell you. And you could talk to anybody who was there at the very beginning when I was first youth pastor, and they can tell you of a moment when the Holy Spirit used me to do something for them in their lives that I didn't do. It was not me. Yes, I may have gotten up out of bed and done whatever it was, but I was being obedient to the Holy Spirit. Chris wouldn't have done that. Chris likes to sleep. It isn't about you. It isn't about me. It isn't about my shortcomings. It isn't about your shortcomings. It's about his awesome nature that can flow through me and you and do things that don't make sense. But they see the boldness of Peter and John. Sadly, too many people are not amazed by our boldness because they are distracted by our similarities. Sadly, too many people are not amazed by our boldness because they are too distracted by our similarities. What do I mean by that? What I mean by that is we talk it, but we don't walk it. We profess it, but we don't live it. Now, I want to go to 2 Corinthians Chapter 6. You got that one? Therefore, come out from among them and be separate, says the Lord. Do not touch what is unclean, and I will receive you. Keep going. I will be a father to you, and you shall be my sons and daughters, says the Lord Almighty. Keep going. You got the next one? Chapter 7, verse 1. Therefore, having these promises, which promises? The ones I just read you. When you're reading the Bible, ignore the chapter break. That's just free. Wasn't there. They did that to organize it for us. But there was no, no chapter break. So it says, therefore, having these promises, what promises? I will be a father to you, and you should be my sons and daughters. That's the promises. Beloved, let us cleanse ourselves from all filthiness of the flesh and the spirit, perfecting holiness in the fear of of God. I could stop preaching and go home just on those verses. Let us cleanse ourselves from all filthiness of the flesh and the spirit and perfecting the holiness in the fear of God. Now, I want to stop for a second and I want you to understand because a lot of times what Christians do, if you're a Christian this morning, I'm not being mean to you, okay? I'm not. Because I'm a Christian too. So I'm talking to myself. A lot of times, when we read scriptures like this, cleansing ourselves from all the filthiness of the flesh, we automatically think of the, the nasty sins. Like we automatically go straight to some type of immorality or some type of addiction or some type of thing that we're like, ugh, thank you, Lord, I'm free from that. I want to let you know that when it says 
the filthiness of the flesh, it isn't just talking about immorality. It's not just talking about getting drunk every weekend. It's not just talking about sleeping around with everybody here and there. It's talking about anything in your flesh that does not line up with who God says you're supposed to be. So you know what that means? You know what's filthiness in our flesh? Holding on to offenses. It's filthiness of our flesh. You know what else is filthiness of our flesh? Being judgmental. Because if you interviewed 25 people today at the mall in Metairie and you asked them, what is the number one thing they cannot stand about Christians? And 25 out of 25 are going to tell you in some way, shape, or form, judging. Being judgmental. Most of the time we're judgmental because we have forgotten who we were when he found us. And we've forgotten how messed up we were and how jacked up we were and how when I was at the bottom in the pit and filthy, he cleaned me and saved me and loved me anyway. But if something happens when I get clean, I don't want to be around the dirt, but we have to remember that our righteousness is of filthy rags. So what does it matter if I'm not as dirty as someone else i'm still not god i'm still not perfect so it doesn't matter it i cannot judge you because you're a little bit dirtier than me in my understanding because when god looks at it dirt is dirt it says here that we're we're supposed to remove all filthiness we're supposed to remove this stuff but you notice put it put it up there again for me gosh i love just going through scripture it is so cool Man, the Bible is addicting. Let us cleanse ourselves from all the filthiness of the flesh and the spirit. <gasps> My spirit can be filthy? Yeah, it can. When your motives are wrong. When your service to the Lord is for the recognition of man, your spirit is dirty. When the, the display of your devotion and your worship is for the approval and recognition of man, your spirit is dirty. You become like the Pharisees who would pray out loud these big, boisterous prayers. That's a dirty spirit. What about being, Lord, help me. Oh. See, I didn't have a whole lot of time to prepare this, right? So the Holy Spirit is doing that right now. What about my spirit being dirty because I can't take correction? When somebody comes to me and says, hey, this happened this week. We got the driven ministry. We do the schools and bring the pizza to the schools. And I was supposed to order pizza and send it to St. Bernard Middle on Friday. And in my calendar, I had written Shelman High on Friday when Shelman High is tomorrow. It's not the regular meetings. It's something different. And I, I just went up my day and swiped the card and I'm running around doing stuff and I ordered pizza and it went. And I get a phone call from Shelmet High. Why is there pizza here? And I was like, oh, it's supposed to be at St. Bernard Middle. So I get a phone call from one of the board members of the organization. And I know why he's calling. And I know that it was literally a mistake. I just put the wrong school on the wrong day. I wasn't being irresponsible. I just had a clerical error because I have a lot of those. I am not the person you want being your administrator. Let me just tell you that right now. And he called me. And he starts saying, he, said, he says, Chris, he said, if this is too much for you, you have to let me know. He said, don't worry if we think you can't do it. Don't worry about what our opinion is going to be because our opinion of you doesn't matter as much as what those kids need. So if you need to humble yourself, Humble. And here I am, and this guy has been a Christian for like 18 months probably, two years. And I had to take it. My flesh didn't want to take it. But I had no choice because I want my spirit clean. I don't want to be one of those Christians that people walk away from. You ever, you ever, you ever met one of those Christians that you hope don't come to the crawfish boil? Uh -huh, don't, don't. This is your moment to laugh and be somewhat critical because I'm doing it too. Where, where I really hope that person don't come. Because they're going to figure out a way to preach from every single conversation we're having. 
You ever met that Christian that complains at every Saints game? Well, if we'd have put this much time in the praying, we'd have souls everywhere. While they're watching the same game. Spirit's dirty. And I'm going to tell you right now, if my flesh is the billboard for what people see, my spirit is what God uses to reach them. My billboard can be great. I could have my lifestyle in check. I could be living my life, clinging to the grace of God, walking to where I'm doing and honoring him with everything that I do. But if they get close to me and my spiritual arrogance starts popping out or my opinionated, they're going to run faster than if they caught you with a joint in your hand. Because nothing is more repulsive to an unbeliever than a Christian who thinks they're better than them. When Peter and John stood before the Pharisees, they saw the boldness. Why was there boldness? There was boldness because they knew there was nothing in them preventing the Holy Spirit from moving. That's why there was boldness. If you ever been asked to do something last minute for the Lord, like off the cuff, and you get terrified, and you're like, I, I can't do this, I can't do this, I can't do this, not because you're afraid to talk in front of people, right? Like, you, I'm just nervous, I'm just nervous. Fear grips you. What is fear gripping to? That's the thing that shouldn't be there. Think about that. Whatever fear is grabbing a hold of, that's what, is, that's what shouldn't be in your life. Because God has not given us a spirit of fear, but a spirit of love, power, and a sound mind. So if he hasn't given me a spirit of fear, and there's fear in my life, fear is clinging to something. Fear is grabbing a hold of something. It's that something I should be rebuking. How many of the times do we respond to us and go, I'm dealing with fear, pray for me. Stop praying about fear and pray about what fear is grabbing onto. Because I want people to look at me and see boldness. I want them to look at me and see Jesus. I want someone to look at me and say, yeah, he can't fix a toilet. He can't do anything with a toolbox. Don't let him near your kitchen. But he's been with Jesus. That's what I want people to say about me. I want them to look at me and know that they know that they know that I have been with Jesus because we shouldn't have to tell the lost we're different we should just have to tell them why. I shouldn't have to put on a performance to let you know that I'm a Christian. Since I've been on Facebook lately, I'll just use this as an analogy. If the only reason people on your Facebook know you're a Christian is because you put Christian things, you're dropping the ball. We should not have to tell the world we're Christians. They should be able to look at us and see something different or feel something different or hear something different and then they should ask us, what is it? And they might not ask you at first, at first conversation. It may take years. But when their marriage is on the rocks or they get the diagnosis or they can't pay their bills or their kids are off on drugs, they're going to remember that there was something different about that guy there's something different three cubicles down on the left there's something different about that teacher something different about that coach something different about that guy that plumber that lawn man that that all there's something different about them and that's when they call you what is it why are you different when well, ain't me it's because of jesus so how do we do this how does the world look at us and see him. How does that happen? John 13, 35. Please. By this, all will know that you are my disciples. If you have love for one another. 1 John chapter 4 says that we love him because he first loved us. That's why we love him. But think about this for a second. If I go home today and I want to boil crawfish, but I put stuff in the pot and I put it in chicken wings, am I going to get crawfish? No. If I do, I'm a millionaire instantly. 
what I put into something is what I'm going to get out of it. If I put apple seeds in the ground, I'm going to get apple trees. If I put acorns in the ground, I'm going to get an oak tree. Galatians 6, 7, do not be deceived. God cannot be mocked whatsoever a man sows. That's so shall he reap. Well, guess what God did? When he sent his son, he sent a seed of love. He sent love. For God so loved the world that he sent his only begotten son. He sent love. Jesus comes and dies on the cross. Romans calls him the firstborn among many brethren. He's the firstborn of us. He is our older brother, spiritually. So if God sent love in Jesus and Jesus died, I'm trying not to go like super fall just into this here. If he sent love, what should he be seeing? That's what he should be seeing. For without love, we're but a clanging cymbal. If I prophesy with the tongues of angels and have not love, what am I? See, when they look at us, you know, when somebody walks through those doors, they should look at us, look at the people in this room, and say, oh my goodness, the love they have for each other. The way they, they look out for each other. The way they, they go to bat for each other. The way they step up and help each other in, their, in each other's weaknesses. The way that we cover one another. That we rejoice when one rejoices and we weep when one weeps. That's what they should see. Because we were first shown love, so when Peter and John walked in to that temple that day, they saw the sick man, all they had was love. That's all I can give you. Jesus. In the fall of 1991, I believe, or 92, I don't know exactly, forgive me. I was a little kid sitting in a suit in a children's crusade in Fort Worth, Texas. I don't remember exactly what was said, but I remember something inside of me knew I needed to give my life to Jesus. So I bowed my little head and I prayed the prayer. The children's worker prayed. And when I opened my eyes, I was in a bubble. Everything around me was kind of muffled. And I knew that I didn't want to be in children's church anymore. I didn't want to be in that crusade. So I got up and walked back into an arena. I got up and was walking the outside, the big old, like the, whatever they call those things. And an usher found me and they said, what are you doing? I said, I'm looking for my mom. He said, let me take you back to Kids Church. I said, I want to go back to Kids Church. I want to go in there. So they found me and brought me back to my family. I can't explain to you how it happened or anything like that, but I know for a fact that that day something got a hold of me. And it hasn't let me go since. I tried to outrun it, and it's faster than me. I tried to hide from it, and it always sees me. I've tried to do other things with it, and it won't let me. Because when he gets a hold of your life, you don't want anything else. Jesus was sent by God through love. He died because of love. I was shown love. And so this morning, I want to let you know that silver and gold I don't have. But what I have I give to you, and that if you are here this morning and your life is not right with Jesus, today is the day of salvation. That's the best thing that I could ever give you.
that is the greatest gift that anyone could ever share with you is that your past, regardless of how ugly and nasty and funky you may think it is, it does not matter because Jesus is the single greatest eraser in history. You know why? Because he doesn't erase. He just removes. And he makes things new. That's why he said, I make all things new. He doesn't change your life. You can change your life. Like I said a couple weeks ago, do a keto diet. You will change your life. But what you can't do is give yourself a new one. When the things that you used to want that aren't right with God, you don't want anymore. The things that you used to desire, you don't want anymore because now you want the things of God. And Psalm 37, 4, that if I delight myself in the Lord, he'll give me the desires of my heart. What do they see when they look at you? If you're here this morning, your life's a billboard for something. And without Jesus, I'm sorry to tell you, but that life is a billboard of some stuff that you don't want to be in. It's prejudice. It's addiction. It's bitterness. It's hurt. It's insecurity. It's fear. It's pride. But this morning, he's looking to give you a new billboard. He's looking to change what people see. And if you're here and you're a Christian this morning and you know that your billboard hasn't been where it needs to be, I got great news. He's really good at changing those things. Because if I confess my sins, he is faithful and just to forgive me and to cleanse me from all unrighteousness. Bow your heads with me this morning. You may be here. This morning you may say, Pastor Chris, I heard you. 